Okay, so good morning everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a very simple question. Uh, namely, if we have... Yeah, I don't know what happens. Okay, so if we have uh, uh, data that is distributed on P servers, and P is a pretty large number, then how much communication do we need to pay? How much communication do we need to do in order to answer a particular query? It's, that's a fundamental question. Uh, let me start by defining the model. I'm st but first, let me learn how to make progress here. How to, uh, so I think I'm on the right slide. So the model we are going to use, a mathematical model, is a simplification or a variation, if you want, of the BSP model by, by variant. Uh, which, um, in which computation is done by P independent servers. These servers they are connected by a network. Uh, they can communicate, uh, each server can communicate with every other server. The data, the input, is of size M. I'm going to use M to denote the size of the input data. And uh, initially, the data is uniformly distributed on uh, these P servers. And the computation go proceeds in rounds. Uh, in the first round, uh, these servers, they reshuffle the data. They communicate and they reshuffle the data. And then they can do some local computation on the data that they have. So this is round one. Then in round two, they, communica they communicate again. They reshuffle. And then they do some local uh, computation. And then in round three, they just continue the same way. And at some point, they output their results locally. And that is the end of the computation. And uh, the, uh, the model, uh, they can talk point, point to point. So each server can send data to any other server. During one round of, 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 of communication, there is a complete data reshuffling, meaning that each server sends its, its some data to all the other servers. And it, it decides exactly which data it will send to each of the other servers. Uh, the nice part is that I assume that the servers are infinitely powerful. So they can compute anything they want and be complete problems, even undecidable problems. The only cost of this, um, in this model is the amount of communication. More precisely, um, I'm going to denote for a, a fixed server U, I'm going to denote L sub U, the amount of data that the server U receives during uh, one round of, communi of communication. That's the data that comes from all the other servers. And I'm going to be interested in the largest of these LUs over all the servers and all the rounds. And the question is, um, what is, uh, how can I minimize this uh, load, this uh, maximum amount of data that each server needs to receive? Uh, I should emphasize um, our motivation for studying this problem is very practical. This is how data is processed today. Uh, this, uh, for example, MapReduce, a very popular um, um, par distributed data processing system, works exactly according to this model. It represents one round of, of this, uh, of the MPC um, uh, model. Um, mo more modern systems like Spark, they also work um, exactly according to this model. And it's a fundamental question to ask, how much data do we need to exchange uh, in order to compute a particular um, problem? Uh, as you will see, um, the mathematics gets quite interesting, um, and it's actually quite hard. Uh, we completely solved only the simplest case, which is for one round. This is what I'm going to talk about today. Next week, uh, Paris Kutris, he will talk about what we know about multiple rounds, uh, which is more limited, but therefore it's more fascinating. Yes? So, so how is this model different than uh, the a, a bounded depth AC circuit with standard LU? Uh, so I'm sure you can, find, you can find connections, but here the, the emphasis is really on, um, uh, on just measuring the amount of, co of communication that comes, uh, that comes into um, uh, in, into a particular server.
Yeah, but I, I should I, I should explain. So I, we discussed it with Anoop, and there there are connections to circuit complexity. Uh, what I'm asking is that yeah, proving uh, yeah, proving super logarithmic like number of rounds, or if it corresponds to super logarithmic depth or not, that's a scary question, right? Uh, yeah. So there there are scary questions for for multi rounds, and this is why I'm not going to talk about multi rounds. I'm going to show you the fun part, which happens in the one round. Uh, so why do we care about, uh, about understanding this, uh, um, you know, this load? Uh, well, here is a simple way to solve any problem on this, in this model. You take the data that's distributed and you send it all to the first server. And the first server is infinitely powerful, can compute anything we want. But then the load is huge. The load is M, is the size of the data. That's not a good plan. Uh, what we would like to have an I is an ideal load, which is m by p, which, is, uh, uh, which means that the data is uniformly distributed. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, engineers they would be very happy because then they achieve a linear speed up. Uh, you increase p, and the load decreases linearly with uh, the increase of a number of servers. As we will see, uh, there are theoretical limitations uh, by which we, uh, we have to pay a we, we, we are forced to accept a, a lower speed up uh, that is um, polynomially uh, smaller. Uh, okay, uh, so a quick background in databases. The kind of problems I'm interested in computing are queries uh, over databases. So we, we are going to use a fixed uh, relational vocabulary. Uh, R1, R2, RL are relational symbols of fixed arities. And a database instance is what's known in, in, uh, in mathematics as a finite structure. Uh, a, a database instance consists of a uh, concrete relation for each uh, uh, relational symbol. And the relation is a subset of uh, a domain of size n um, and has um, RIT I mean, to the power uh, the RIT of that relation. Uh, I'm going to denote with lowercase m the cardinalities, a number of tuples in these relations. And uh, for the lower bounds, uh, it's actually more convenient to express the sizes of these relations in terms of bits. And then uh, we need to multiply by log n, the, the size of the domain. The kind of problems that we try to so solve is what we love in databases. Uh, they are multi-way joints. So we want to join uh, these relations according to the joint criteria, and we want to output the result. No worries, I'm going to have a sim very simple example. Uh, with the simplest kind of join. So here we have uh, two relations called R and S. They are both binary. And uh, the way I express a query of there at the left is we say uh, retrieve all triples x, y, z for which x, y is in R and y, z is in S. So for example, uh, we have this small uh, database instance with three tuples in R, three tuples in S. And the result of the join is shown here on the right. Notice that the result of, of this join can be anywhere between uh, zero outputs if uh, no tuples in R join with any tuples in S, or it can be as big as their product. Good, so how, how do we compute this simple query? And I'm going to be interested in more complex queries than this one. How do we compute this in the MPC model? Uh, this is actually what uh, all database systems do today. Uh, they use what we call a hash partition join, um, which uh, goes as follows. Uh, the data is initially distributed somehow across the servers. Uh, the algorithm has no control over how the data is distributed. Um, and um, every server looks at its local data. If it has uh, tuples from R, then it applies a hash function to the y value and sends this, this tuple to the server given by the hash function h of y. And if it has a tuple yz from s, it does exactly the same thing. It applies uh, the function h to the y value and sends it to the server uh, defined by that hash function. So after one round of communication, uh, all the data that need, can join uh, has landed to a single server and um, uh, the, uh, the servers can compute locally the join and uh, output the result. Good, so what is the load for this simple algorithm? And um, it's very easy to see that if the data has no skew, then the load is m by p. We expect 
uh, we expect that um, each server will receive uh, about m by p um, um, f amount of data from the, in, in, from the total amount of data, which is m. This is why people say that SQL is embarrassingly parallel. Now, you might object about my um, um, assumptions here, no skew. I have only one slide to, to, ex to explain what I mean by skew and uh, how I'm going to treat it in this talk. So here is a simple experiment. Imagine you have M data items. And there might, there might be repetitions. So that's the same value might, might occur multiple times in, this, in these M data items. And uh, we're going to choose a random hash function H. And we're going to distribute these M data items to P buckets, to P bins, according to the hash function H. And my first observation is that for each bin U, for each server U, the expected number of items that this server receives is exactly M by P. It's over the choice of the random hash function H. That's a simple observation. The second simple observation is this. If in my data set, some item occurs more than m by p times. It has a degree or a frequency that is more than m by p. Then obviously, no matter how small my, my, my hash function is, one of the servers will be overloaded. We'll have a load more than m by p. We call that a heavy hitter, and we say that the data is skewed if such a heavy hitter exists in the data. Uh, and uh, what we, we, we can show in, in various um, instances, and that is what I'm going to use in this, in this talk, is that the converse also holds. If the database is queue-free, me meaning that no item occurs with a frequency more than the number of, uh, than, than the, the load of the bucket that I'm expecting, then um, with, high, with high probability, the maximum load per, for each, uh, in each um, bucket will be uh, M by P. So in this talk, I'm going to assume that the database is queue-free, and I'm not going to def define very formally what queue-free means. Means It's going to mean something like this. I'm going to explain briefly in, e in each case what I mean by queue-free. So yes. Right. Uh, so they have to, uh, so at the end of the uh, computation, they have to output what they think is, is a correct output. And uh, success is when uh, they, have, uh, co they have produced all the outputs, even with the repetition. Uh, which begs the question, what happens if the, the um, question is a decision problem? Uh, and we haven't thought too deeply about that. But in that case, I assume one of the servers must, must declare uh, success must um, accept. Yes. So, so, so it's not quite the, the case where actually all the outputs are connected to a certain server. That's correct. We do not require the outputs to be collected at, at a central server. Because then it would reduce. It would be because then, sorry. In that case, you could do better. You could do better. Maybe. Well, the outputs are often very big. In the case of a join, the output can be as big as m squared, while uh, we are only allowing an m by p amount of, of uh, uh, load because we only count the incoming data. What the servers produce as output, this is not our concern. It's not multi -workaround. Sorry? Multi this is in, in one round. It, this is one reason why multiple rounds are so difficult, because uh, the, intermediate, the intermediate size increases. Good. So uh, um, this is a brief outline. For, I mean, this is the um, main result that I want to describe in this talk. Uh, we are, I'm going to uh, give you the, the um, um, precise load, uh, upper and lower bound load, for computing an, an arbitrary multi-joint query um, over a skew-free database. And the, sh the, uh, the, the shape of the formula is some kind of geometric mean of the input divided by p to, some, uh, certain, to a certain power, which is uh, uh, going to result in a sublinear speed up. Uh, so the algorithm is actually very simple, but it's cute. It's, it's a very nice algorithm for computing uh, these queries. Um, it's a simple one. 
the, I'm, I'm going to spend most of the time uh, on the proof because to prove lower bounds uh, requires information theory, and this is where the connection is interesting between information theory and parallel um, computation. Now, if you think about this as a result in communication complexity, uh, it is um, interesting because um, here, uh, even if we allowed the entire data to be exchanged, we still cannot compute the, the query. Uh, we need to exchange more than the entire amount of data in order to compute, compute the query. Excuse yes. Me. And what is Q? Q is the join of uh, L revolutions or what? Uh, Q is, is a qu what we call a query. That's, that is a question that we need to answer. Any question? Oh, it has to be of that uh, form. It's a conjunction of, of, pre of uh, predicates over the uh, input relations. Ah, so Common? I, I don't think I understand what, which common. The comma, R1, X1. Ah, the comma. Comma is end. Yes. Uh, comma is end. I should have used end. So does it include connectivity as a special case? It, it does not include connectivity in the sense that um, connectivity requires recursion. Here we can only con con uh, we can only take the uh, conjunction of a fixed number L of, of predicates. Uh, it does in terms of lower bounds. It, uh, we can prove lower bounds for connectivity on graphs whose diameter is no bigger than L. Yes. This is just one round. So we we can we can prove something, uh, but. We also have results for multiple rounds. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this at the end. But uh, no, it does not include immediately connectivity. You have to work a little bit to get there. Good. So here is the outline for my talk. If I could see the time, that would be nice. Um, so I'm going to first discuss a simple query, which is very interesting, a uh, triangle query. Then I'm going to move to general queries. And then I'm going to summarize. Uh, the triangle query. So we saw the, a simple join that joins two relations. Let's see a more interesting query, one that wants to compute, where we want to compute all triangles, x, y, z, where x, y is a tuple occurring in R, y, z occurs in S, and z, x occurs in T. Uh, standard database engines today uh, would compute such a query by first joining R and S, and then they obtain an intermediate result that can be huge. And then they join this result, which is now huge, with T. And this is not a great idea. Uh, here is the, the cute algorithm that I mentioned earlier that um, can compute this query in a single round without having to, uh, to, uh, com to materialize that huge intermediate result. And the idea uh, that it actually um, first described in this way in the paper by Afratin and Ullman, uh, takes these P servers and organizes them in a cube, in a cube of, of size uh, cubic root of P. So now each server is identified by three numbers, uh, the three coordinates, uh, three numbers between one and a cubic root of P. Uh, we choose three independent hash functions, and now the idea is the following. Uh, each server, in parallel, examines its input. If it has a, a tuple x, y from the relation R, then uh, it, it, it applies the hash functions to x and y, to the two coordinates of this tuple. But it does not have the third coordinate. So the idea then is to uh, replicate this tuple, to send it to all the servers that uh, uh, whose coordinates are h1 of x and h2 of y, uh, regardless of what the third coordinate is. It's a local uh, replication of the tuple, which means that the, the total amount of data that's going to be exchanged is going to be uh, super linear. Uh, but uh, as you will see, that is, that is necessary. So tuples x, y from R are sent to essentially the, the one face of the cube and replicated along the, the other dimension. Tuples yz from s are sent to a different phase of the cube 
and replicated along the, the missing dimen dimension, and similarly for the tuples z, x of t. And after this communication, um, our, every server takes the data, it collects the data locally that it has received, and computes locally all the triangles. If you think a little bit, this algorithm is correct, because every potential triangle x, y, z will be seen by the server with coordinates h of x, h of y, and h of z. Good. So um, what is it, the load? Um, let's define, let's, let's uh, define L to be the, the total size of the database divided by p to the two thirds. Uh, it's very easy to see that for every server u, the expected load at that server u is exactly that quantity, um, m1 plus m2 plus m3 by p to the uh, two thirds. Just because we are sending each item to a face of the cube, and the face has p to the power two thirds servers. And uh, what we proved is uh, that the opposite also holds. If the data has no skew, then with high pr probability, um, the load is not, is not going to exceed this quantity. OK, so a short discussion. Uh, so the algorithm was introduced by Afratin and Ullman, and later they called it the shares algorithm. Uh, we analyzed it, and the analysis uh, is what I'm going to show you today. We called it the hypercube algorithm, so we I'm going to refer to it as a hypercube algorithm for computing uh, triangles. Uh, notice that um, this way of partitioning uh, the data is actually quite interesting. So you apply two uh, hash functions to the two coordinates, and uh, this, uh, their combination tells you where to send the data. This is actually more tolerant to skew than joins, because the number of packets now is smaller. It's only p to the one third. So we can tolerate a uh, degree up to m by p to the one third uh, before we run into trouble. We exceed the, exceed the side of the buckets. So yes. Uh, false positives? No, no, the, the algorithm is correct. It is always correct. Uh, what can happen, though, uh, the, the hash with a very small probability, the hash function might send too many items to the same server whose load will be more than, um, than the, the expected load. So the, the, with, with high probability, it's with, with the choice uh, over the choice of the hash function. It's a zero error alg algorithm, yes. Can you explain may, maybe the setting? Because uh -huh. it seems that you now send the data to many places. Right. So def definitely you will get less information transfer if you send all the data once to one server, as you said at the beginning. Right. So still, what, 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 that, what is that an achievement? The achievement, uh, and, and I can tell you what, what happens in practice. In practice, uh, the server, they don't have enough memory to, to store uh, the entire data. Uh, we are processing terabytes of data. Servers, they don't have uh, their chips. For practical reasons, clear, but when you say speed up, it's compared to what? Uh, sp speed up is... Good. Uh, so here we do not have a linear speed up. If we double the number of servers, we do not reduce the load by two because we, uh, the power there is to the third. So the question is, can we do better? And the answer is no. Uh, we cannot do better. And this is where the connection to, inf to information theory will uh, come into play. Um, and uh, the, we will prove a lower bound based um, uh, for, for inputs that are actually very simple inputs, very simple databases. They are permutations. So permutation is um, something that looks like, like here. Uh, it means that the values 1 to n uh, occur exactly once in, every, in both columns of the, uh, of the relation. <coughs> Think of them as, as, as like bipartite graphs with uh, in degree and out degree 1. Um, so here is a sh uh, small example. We have three permutations, and the, the triangles are shown at the right there. Uh, we happen to have just two triangles. Okay, 
I'm going to now to switch from measuring the size of the um, relations in tuples to measuring it in bits. And uh, the, the, the number of bits is um, log of n factorial, the number of bits needed to uh, represent one permutation. So uh, all three uh, relations require three log of n factorial to uh, encode, to encode the entire database. And the, the, what we prove uh, is that the, the lower bound for the load is the size in bits to encode the database divided by uh, p to the two thirds. The actual statement is actually quite interesting. We prove the following, that uh, if you have an algorithm that uh, uses a load strictly lower than the quantity that we claim to be the lower bound, and this algorithm is correct in the sense that it always returns uh, a, a, a tr correct triangles. So it makes no, no errors. Then, over the, uh, um, uh, over, uh, over the random choices of, of permutations, the, the expected number of triangles that this algorithm can report is only a fraction uh, of the expected number of correct triangles that the query should return. So in particular, if uh, the load that we are trying to uh, achieve with this algorithm is less than that formula, m by p to the two thirds, it means that the algorithm will not be able to return uh, all the triangles for some, uh, some input databases D. Okay, so it's an, it's an uh, average um, uh, impossibility result over the choices of the data. And I will prove this, but before I, I go to the proof, let me just uh, uh, do some comments. Um, that implies that there, there will be uh, some deterministic, uh, for any algorithm, determ it, it implies that for any deterministic algorithm A, there is a bad input where that deterministic algorithm will fail. But actually, it implies something stronger by using Yao's theorem. Uh, namely, even if we use a non-determinist, a randomized algorithm, then um, there exists there exist a bad input for that algorithm, where the algorithm will uh, uh, fail to compute the query correctly with high probability. Good. So what I want to do next, uh, I have several proofs prepared. I might, might skip off some of them, but definitely not this one. I want to, sh to show you the, the proof of, um, uh, of this statement that an algorithm that uses a load less than the uh, lower bound uh, uh, fails to, to compute correctly the triangles. I want to show this proof because this is where the connection to information theory is, uh, uh, becomes interesting. So remember, we have an inequality between the expected number of triangles returned by the algorithm and the expected number of triangles uh, um, that the, uh, returned by the query. Let me start with something simple. Uh, the expected number of triangles contained in three permutations. So this is the expected number of the, uh, of the query Q. And it turns out uh, there is one triangle in expectation. Uh, sh is this obvious or? OK, so uh, it will be quite obvious. Uh, first, a statement. If, if we choose a permutation at random, then a fixed edge ij from i to j belongs to this permutation with probability 1 by n. Right? Because from i, I have exactly n choices. Each of them is equally likely, so i by j has probability uh, n. Now we can compute the expected number of triangles. Uh, we apply the linearity of expectation. So this is a sum over all candidate triangles, i, j, k of uh, the product of the probabilities that um, ij and jk and ki are in the three permutations r, s, and t. So we have n cube candidate triangles. Uh, each of the probabilities is 1 by n. We multiply and we get there is one triangle in expectation in our result. Good. That was the first part. Now, the, now we look at the algorithm. So the algorithm 
receives these messages, uh, the algorithm consists of the two phases, the communication phase and computation phase. I'm going to focus on what, what happens after the communication phase. What does one server learn about um, uh, th these inputs, uh, given that it only receives a small number of bits about the three relations R, S, R, S, and T? So I'm going to denote with SMG 1, 2, and 3 the concrete messages, the, 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 those bits that the servers receive about uh, R, about S, and about T. Now the inputs are uh, initially distributed arbitrarily on the on the servers, and without without any uh, without loss of generality, we can assume that no server sees any um, uh, no server sees two two inputs. So R, S, and T they sit on these joint sets of servers, which means that these messages they will be completely independent over the random choices of the permutations. So the question is, what do we learn uh, by seeing these, uh, uh, these three messages? Uh, so um, we learn, uh, we, so we, we need log of n factorial bits to represent the entire permutation. We only get a small number of bits. So that will tell us uh, that some will tell us about some edges in the permutation, but not all of them. Let me denote with k of the message the set of known edges. Uh, these are the edges ij with a property that uh, for any input permutation uh, that generates that message. Uh, ij belongs to the permutation. This is actually very, very intuitive to see. I receive these few, no, few bits cor corresponding to message one. And I'm asking the question, which edges are in the permutation? The way to do, to do it is to reverse, to, to compute the inverse function, to enumerate all possible permutations that could have possibly generated this message, and check if an edge belongs to all of them. And then we know that, that edge. The question is, how many do we know? Oh, uh, be, be, before that, a simple observation. Since we only have one round, uh, the, a server can output a triangle IJK uh, only if it knows for sure that IJ is in the first um, relation, JK in the second, and KI in the third relation. So the question to ask is how many uh, edges IJ can a server know? And again, we are using the fact that the size of the message is limited. So the size of the, of the message, um, and I'm going to focus on the message received about the first permutation, uh, that size uh, uh, is going to be, uh, let me call it F1, the fraction of bits uh, of the that the, the ratio between the number of bits of the message and the number of bits needed to represent the entire uh, permutation. If I receive all the bits about the permutation, then of course I know all the edges, but I receive only a tiny amount, uh, a fraction F1 of the bits. This is a key uh, proposition. It says something very simple, uh, but this makes an interesting connection to information theory. It says that um, if we receive at most a fraction f1 of the number of bits needed to represent the permutation, then the expected number of edges that we learn uh, is at most uh, f1 times the size of the relation r. The size of the relation is m, is n, sorry, it's in, it's the size, the <coughs> how, many, how many edges we have in the permutation. So if we only receive f1 fraction of the bits, we can only learn f1 fraction of the edges. So let's prove this. Um, it relies on two simple observations. The first is that if we receive a message, um, a, a MSMG one of bits, then uh, if, if we know uh, a large number of, of edges, k is the number of edges that we know, then the, the conditional entropy uh, of, of R, given this message, cannot be, uh, has to be small. 
and particularly it has to be less than 1 minus k by n times the entropy of, of R. So here is why. If we claim that we know k edges, that means that the, the permutation is defined by the remaining n minus k uh, things to permute. Uh, therefore, its entropy is at most uh, log of n minus k factorial. Now, uh, on the second line, you can see a very simple inequality. It says that log, log of n minus k factorial by n minus k, this is just a, an arithmetic mean of log of 1 plus log of 2 plus log of k n minus k. This is less than log of n factorial by n, which is also an arithmetic mean, but of um, more numbers and they are bigger. So this is what uh, the, uh, this inequality says. If we were to learn a large number k of edges, then the conditional entropy has to be small. On the other hand, the, uh, the entropy of H consists of the, the conditional entropy uh, give, uh, of, of, of R uh, given the message plus the entropy of the message itself. So let me go over this a little bit slower. Uh, the entropy of the permutation R is the same as the entropy of R and the, and the message. Because a message is computed deterministically from uh, the, the, um, the permutation. By the chain rule, this is the entropy of the message, the small, small message, plus the conditional entropy that we argued has to be small. Now, um, both cannot be small because the entropy of the message we argued is less than F1 times, times H. Uh, and therefore, it's just a matter of massaging this inequality. Um, so what, what I wrote here is that the conditional entropy is just the expected value of the conditional entropy on the particular message uh, for which we have the previous inequality. Uh, and now we just simplify this in equation and we get that the expected number of uh, um, known, uh, known edges in the message is less than F1 times N. So we only learn an, an F1 fraction of the, of the edges that we need to, uh, to learn. Good, so now we know exactly what one server can do. One server learns a small fraction of edges from the first permutation a small fraction of edges from the second, and similarly of the third. Let's see what that single server can output. So that is part three. Now we are going to compute how many triangles can the algorithm output. Um, so for that, Remember, when we computed the number of triangles that the query had to output, we looked at the probability that ij belongs to, the rela to a relation. Now we are going to look at the probability that ij is known by the server. And I'm going to denote this with a sub ij. So that's the probability that the server knows that ij is in the, in the permutation R. So the number, the expected number of triangles that a server can uh, output is um, the sum over all candidate triangles of the probability that the server knows the first edge and knows the second edge and knows the third edge. Now, uh, to ignore that inequality, um, I want to first show you what we know about AIJ. Uh, on one hand, Aij is clearly less than 1 by n. If the server knows the edge ij, then ij is in the permutation. And that probability is less than 1 by n. On the other hand, we also know uh, that the sum of the Aij's, that is the expected number of, of edges that the server knows. And we have shown this is just uh, n times a fraction of the, of the um, uh, number of bits in the message by the number of bits needed to compute, to, to represent the entire, um, the entire entropy. So that's what we know about AIJ. Now, how do we massage that sum, sum of over IJ and K, of AIJ, BJK, and CKI? And here we use an inequality uh, that we found in a paper by Friedgut, uh, I think from 2006. 
Uh, so we, we call it a free good inequality. The sum of that quantity is less than the sum of Aij squared uh, times <coughs> the Bijk squared uh, times Cki squared, uh, everything under square root. So actually, I wanted to ask uh, in this room, is this inequality known in, in, uh, in the information theory community? Yes, it's exactly the inequality for entropies of, 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 of triple and entropies of three entropies of P's, I guess. Yeah, so the, um, Friedgut proves, it, proves this using entropy. It's actually more concrete than, than it looks. So we, we studied that, that proof in detail. I have a much simpler proof for, for you in a few slides. And I think that I'm going to show you that particular proof. Uh, so yeah, so it's a beautiful inequality. But it serves perfectly our purpose uh, in, in, this, in this case here. It's also a consequence of Cauchy inequality. Exactly. That, that's what I wanted to, to show you. It's, it, can, it can be shown by induction. By induction, but uh, not, not on the domain, but on the structure of the hypergraph. Let me not uh, go ahead. So now it's a matter of massaging this inequality. Uh, we, I need to apply both inequalities about Aij to get what we need. Um, uh, so the sum of Aij squared is um, 1 by n from, for the first, and the sum of Aij is for the second. And it turns out to be uh, the number of bits for the first message by log of n squared. Uh, we apply ar the arithmetic in, um, geometric inequality once. And finally, we get exactly what we want. We get um, uh, L by M here. L is a, the size of the message that the server received. And M is um, the um, number of bits needed to represent the entire permutation. That was one server. Uh, now, uh, we, uh, to, to find out how many triangles all the servers report, we multiply by P. We push P inside. Uh, and because of this power 3 by 2, we get that the ideal load is m by uh, p to the two, two thirds. And that, that completes the proof. OK, so let me uh, make a plan. So I still have like 10 minutes. OK, good. So then I'm going to show you um, Right, so let me skip this. Let me show you the, um, how this generalizes, and then we, then we will stop there. So the triangle query was just one example. Uh, but now we understand how, uh, what is the optimal load for any query. And any query means essentially a hypergraph, uh, where the nodes are uh, the, the variables of the query, and the hyper edges are the relations uh, that we want to join. Uh, and I'm going to show you just a simple case, uh, maybe that's if the ob obvious case, when all the uh, relation sizes are equal. They are equal to, to m. And I'm going to skip the more general case when they are unequal. So uh, to compute this query, we can apply exactly the same, uh, the same algorithm. Uh, now uh, we need to partition the servers into a hypercube. Of, uh, with as many dimensions, as many variables we have in the query. Uh, and every server looks at its input. If it has a tuple from the relation Rj, then it con com can compute the, the coordinates uh, along the dimensions that appear in this in Rj. Uh, and for the others, we'll simply broadcast uh, this, this tuple to the other, uh, the other dimensions. So the, the algorithm is essentially unchanged. Uh, the, the question is, how do we analyze this? And I'm going to um, just show you the end result for uh, equal cardinalities when all the input databases, uh, all the input relations have the same cardinality. Then the connection is, is um, I mean, the, the, the load, the optimal load, is given by the uh, fractional vertex cover and the fractional edge packing of, of the query. So let me quickly define this. Think about our query as a hypergraph. Uh, the variables are the nodes, and the, the relations are the, the edges. For example, for the triangle query, the hypergraph is just a triangle. It, it's x, y, and z the variables, and three, three edges. In general, it can be a more complicated hypergraph. A fractional vertex cover is simply a set of numbers associated to the vert vertices, such that for any hyper edge, the, the sum of the, um, of the numbers associated to the nodes in that hyper edge is at least one. 
dually, a fractional edge packing uh, is, is a um, uh, is a set of numbers such that the sum um, uh, associated to hyperedges, such that for any variable, f uh, for any node, uh, the sum of the numbers associated to the hyperedges that contains that variable is at most one. So these are standard results, these are standard notions in, uh, uh, in graph theory. And um, uh, by, by strong duality, the minimum value of a vert fractional vertex cover is equal to the uh, maximum value of the fractional edge packing, and uh, it's often denoted with tau star. So now the result that we have, and uh, let me skip this definition, uh, the result that we have uh, essentially says that um, the, the, uh, the optimal fractional um, vertex cover or fraction of optimal fractional edge packing gives us the optimal load. And it's stated like this. First of all, uh, if, if you're looking at the algorithm, uh, we, uh, the, we, the shares, the, 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 those dimensions, need to be chosen uh, p to the power the um, fractional vertex cover uh, normalized by the sum of, the, uh, of, all the, uh, uh, fraction of all the vertex covers. Uh, normalized because then we, when we multiply these shares, the volume of the hypercube is exactly p. The interesting part is in the lower bound. So in the lower bound, and we proved this for, um, for generalizations of permutations, uh, the, the, the formula is associated to a uh, fractional edge packing, and it goes like this. We take the, the, represent, the number of bits needed for a relation, uh, for each relation R, Rj, and um, we raise this to the, to the power um, Uj, where Uj is a fractional edge uh, packing for that, for that edge. Uh, this gives us like a jump, and then we, we raise to the power 1 by the sum of um, all the fractional edge um, packings. This gives us a geometric, uh, geometric um, mean of the uh, input sizes divided by p, and then the, the power of p is exactly 1 by, uh, uh, by the sum of um, the fractional edge, edge packings. And it turns out that each such, for, for every edge, uh, fractional edge packing, this quantity is a lower bound on the, um, on the amount of communication that uh, um, the servers need to incur to compute the, uh, the query. When the sizes are equal, then um, uh, it's easy to see that these, these two quantities are the same because of the strong duality. Um, if they are not equal, the lower bound still, still applies. Interestingly, so the lower bound is, it now becomes the, 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 um, the important formula. For the upper, the upper bound no longer applies. Uh, there we need to solve a different um, linear program and then we, we, st we get a matching, uh, um, uh, matching algorithm. So, and so for general cardinalities, this the second formula is the more interesting one. Good. So um, since I'm running out of time, I want to uh, briefly discuss, uh, discuss, uh, I mean, summarize and um, discuss related work. OK, so how do I get here? Good. So I kind of skipped over general queries, but I, have to, I want to spend two minutes uh, summarizing and uh, discussing related work. So the, the motivation from this for this work is very practical. This is how modern uh, large-scale data analytics work. They uh, process data locally, reshuffle, process more, reshuffle. And the question is, how can we minimize the communication cost? Um, the, the, the algorithm I, I showed you, um, called Hypercube, computes any conjunctive query, any multi-joint query, in a single round. And we know exactly its, uh, its load, its complexity. Bottom line, the speed up is 1 by p to the power should be 1 by tau star. Uh, so the speed up is sublinear, and it depends on the uh, fractional edge, uh, co edge, edge packing number of the uh, query hypergraph. Uh, next week, Paris Kutris will talk about multiple rounds, and we'll talk about skewed data. And we have some partial results here. I wanted to have a, a brief, um, I wanted to leave the slide with um, uh, open questions. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't have any um, lower bound results 
for multi-rounds and uh, non-skewed non data. Uh, any such result will tell something, will tell us something about circuit complexity, so that will be probably very, very hard. Uh, we do have some uh, results uh, in this space, but assuming a, a more restricted communication model, so that, that, that those results tell us nothing about um, uh, circuit complexity. Uh, it, it would be very interesting to study skewed databases. Um, so he, here is interesting, and Paris will show this to you next week, Paris Kutris. Uh, we know a, a, general, uh, lower, a general lower bound on the communication cost, which does apply to circuit complexity, uh, but it is for skewed data. It says that because the result is so big, then you must pay this, this amount of, uh, of uh, communication cost. Um, so it, it is interesting, but it is limited because it's an impossibility based on the size of the output result. Uh, however, we do not know if this uh, um, uh, lower bound is tight, uh, and we don't have an algorithm that co can match this uh, lower bound. We have an algorithm that only works for very limited queries. And I will stop here.